And this week's Cardiology Countdown will actually begin with a, an online publication from the Food and Drug Administration regarding new safety information on the antiarrhythmic dronetarone, um, brand name Moltac. The FDA called attention to two cases of acute liver injury that led ultimately to liver transplantation in patients who had gotten dronetarone. Um, there weren't other attributable causes in the statement uh, that FDA made, although no details were available. And they said that uh, we as healthcare professionals should be alert to uh, any potential liver toxicity. So if patients had anorexia, nausea, vomiting, fever, malaise, uh, right upper quadrant pain, that one would at least be aware of this, check liver function tests, and, and proceed uh, from there. They also suggested periodic uh, LFT checking, especially in the first six months of patients who've started on dronetarone. So more information to follow, but important safety information. At the number two spot in this week's countdown, I have an article from Jack that's an expedited publication, the CONNECT trial. And this is a, um, a terrific study where patients who had an ICD with or without um, resynchronization uh, pacing had uh, wireless information transfer back to the physician in one group, and the other group had that information simply stored. And so um, this study, CONNECT, was the clinical evaluation of remote notification to reduce time to clinical decision. And so the hypothesis was that if physicians were given real-time information as events were picked up in the monitor of the devices, they could act more quickly and potentially avoid hospitalizations and or uh, extra clinic visits. And they found, in fact, that there was a dramatic reduction between the time an event occurred um, in the wireless group versus standard care with periodic office visits, where the time uh, between an event happening and, and uh, change in care was uh, 4.6 days versus 22 days in the uh, standard care group. They also found that amongst those who were then hospitalized for serious events, the length of stay was significantly reduced um, from four down to three and a half days, uh, a significant one that was associated with about a $1,700 cost savings. There also was an expected reduction in the number of office visits with this information sent remotely. So this technology looks like it's um, helpful in identifying early the events and could potentially be cost savings and, and reduce the burden uh, in monitoring patients. And at the top pick this week is a study uh, by Greg Stone and colleagues called Prospect, looking at the natural history of different types of plaques in patients following an acute coronary syndrome. The um, rationale here was that it's known that many acute coronary syndromes develop at plaques that are not tight, that have a minimal stenosis, say 30 to 50 percent. And so how could one predict which plaques will go on to rupture and lead to events? And so they did three-vessel IVUS with virtual histology to try and characterize all the plaques and then collected information on events and follow-up and uh, which artery uh, was involved. They found that the culprit artery explained about half of the recurrent events, whereas new lesions developed at uh, plaques that were not tight stenoses in the other half of the events. And in particular, the thin cap fibroatheroma looked to be the culprit in um, the patients who go on to have a new lesion into an acute coronary syndrome. And so the so-called vulnerable plaque could be identified with IVUS and virtual histology. And so this is a very interesting study that reminds us what the target is as we apply uh, many of our therapies. So with this week's Cardiology Countdown, I'm Chris Cannon. 